You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to the Options Playbook, the program where we break down cutting-edge option strategies and explain how you can incorporate them into your own portfolio. Whether you're looking to grow your capital with some offensive maneuvers or protect your investments with defensive plays, you can find them all in the Options Playbook. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA, and SIPC. Now, let's open the playbook and get started. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for Options Playbook Radio, the program here on the Options Insider Radio Network, where we break down the sometimes impenetrable world of options into some offensive and defensive plays that you can utilize in your own portfolio. My name, of course, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting network upon which so many of you are binging these days. I thank you all for continuing to drive up our bandwidth bills here on the network. A first world problem to have here as we kick off our now 17th year, 16 plus years. It's crazy, crazy. It's January was our 16th anniversary. So crazy town out here. Listeners, it's been going for a while here. We appreciate all of you who've taken the time to tune in over the years. Of course, we take the time to rate it and review it on your platform of choice. It also clearly does have an impact on the new folks, just like Jeets did. Jeets with a J here for OPR saying so much info on one show jam packed with content. Five stars. Well, thank you, Jeets. And everyone else who takes the time to go out there and rate it or review it on your platform of choice. It clearly does have an impact. New people are discovering the show all the time, literally every day. And it's in no small part. Thanks to all of you who take the time to do that. So we do appreciate all of you out there. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond the network is not enough for you listeners. Nearly a dozen program, not enough. You want to go above and beyond. And hey, we get it. People want more all the time. Well, that's what theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is for. You head on over there. You can check out, of course, our exclusive great pro Q&As. You guys are going to ask a bunch of questions today. If you like asking questions, our pro Q&A sessions are for you. Get a chance to pick the brains, I should say, of the, some of the best minds in the world of options and derivatives every week. And then, of course, uh, options oddities, great giveaways, live access to Everything we do here on the network and a whole bunch more. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to learn more about all that fun as we keep on rolling into the show. Because you know what? You're probably saying to yourself, self, he's not the normal host of the show. And you are correct. So allow me to introduce your regular weekly host, the options guy himself, Mr. Brian Overby from Ally Invest. Mr. Overby, welcome back to your own show, sir. Well, awesome to be here, Mark. I always love it when you take the time to be able to come in and uh, ask me some listener questions. And I do appreciate your time without a doubt. And then we get to huddle up and these become, you know, usually my favorite shows as far as Options Playbook Radio is concerned. So let's huddle up. It's time to huddle up and answer questions about your favorite options plays. Submit your questions via twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or questions at the options insider.com. All right, everybody, welcome to the huddle, the portion of the show where you folks take the range, your questions, your comments, your insights, your pearls of wisdom 
that you want to share with the fellow listeners out there. Let's kick it off. We're kind of recording this an interesting time. Just have the new uh, CPI numbers, the new inflation numbers coming out and uh, not exactly great for the market market selling off here today. So this always raises the specter of what kind of market are we in, which dovetails nicely, Brian, with our question of the week, which is live right now. Kind of a silly one, kind of a fun one. But we are, of course, coming off the big Super Bowl game just this past weekend here. So we thought, let's have some fun with that. Let's take a look at the Super Bowl indicator. And the Super Bowl indicator says that a win by the AFC, which, of course, in this example is the Chiefs, doesn't exactly bode well for the market this year. So we asked you folks out there, you folks buying what this indicator is selling. Do you think SPX is going to end the year in the red? Simple yes or no. Uh, Brian, are you a big follower of the Super Bowl indicator? And then B, are you buying what it's selling this year? Sir? <laughs> well, obviously, these indicators are just fun in general. I think I would rather see the the puppy wars uh, de- indicating who's going to win the Super Bowl as opposed <laughs> to what it's going to do to the market. So I've always enjoyed uh, uh, either hamsters trying to battle it out or, uh, you know, the puppies that are uh, available for adoption trying to decide who's going to win the Super Bowl. Um, you know, a lot of these have been debunked. And I do I do remember reading, uh, actually, I think we had one in our uh, Ally Invest community uh, talking a little bit about uh, AFC versus NFC, uh, but don't put a lot of weight to them. But they are fun. Uh, why not? Right? It's a big event. Millions upon millions of people are watching them. So, uh, w- you know, the one I wish that, as far as the poll is concerned, I, I think a good question would have been: uh, Will the Eagles fans tear up uh, Philadelphia more if they win or if they <laughs> lose? I would like to. Going to say that. they're going to tear it up either way, right? So <laughs> yeah. Uh, so exactly how much uh, damage are they going to do if they lose versus win? Um, but yeah, I don't put a lot of, a lot of weight into it. Um, but I'd be really interesting to see what the, what the survey said. First off, how dare you besmirch the Super Bowl <laughs> indicator? This is a, this is serious economic business we're getting to here, sir. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the, it. it looks I like the it. audience, they were actually pretty, almost exactly evenly split until right before showtime. Looks like uh, the, the no. So in this case, no means you think the S&P will close up. You don't believe the indicator. Just taking a slight lead, about 54%, 46 right now for saying they yes, they believe it, and the S will close down on the year. Obviously, we are up right now on the year, not today, but net on the year. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of momentum on that side. But still, interesting. Market kind of evenly split, Brian, which makes makes a market at the end of the day, which is which is kind of fun. <laughs> All right, let's there let's dispense with the silly nonsense. Let's get to the serious hard-hitting stuff. Mr. Overby, are you ready to talk some zero day? Because apparently our audience is all about it. Yeah, I don't think we've done a listener uh, event in, recently where we haven't talked about zero day. So let, let's let's do it. Let's get it out of the way. It is all the rage with cool kids <laughs> these days, Brian. So we've got uh, Tim come at us. Just Tim. Tim says, does Mr. Overby think the zero day trend will expand soon to stocks like Apple and meta brian this is kind of the million dollar question everyone's asking maybe maybe the second million dollar question with zero day the first one a lot of people are asking is what really is the impact of this stuff on things like the vix and i don't know if we really know the answer to that first one yet but uh, the second one is of course when will we see more of these when will we see this expand beyond the indexes beyond the spx to other names we like to trade so brian what is your answer here for mr tip well I mean, I don't necessarily see a need in, in these stocks, and I prefer that that, they, that we don't go down that trend. I'd rather have the liquidity available. And, and even though, the like you're talking stocks like Apple and Meta, extremely heavily traded underlyings, but um, I still would rather have less options available to trade as far as expirations are concerned, because I just like to have the liquidity. Once the more and more choices that are out there, uh, it's going to affect liquidity in some way, shape or fashion. But Apple and Meta might be a little bit insulated from that, uh, in particular Apple. But I, I just don't see it expanding to stocks. In the near term, I don't know if we could fight that battle, though, Mark. I think eventually it's going to happen. I'm just kind of hoping that it's later as opposed to sooner because I'm not a big fan 
of zero day options in these underlying stocks. Now, with that said, and the last time we had this question, I have talked about the fact, and I just recently did it with Booking Holdings uh, and their earnings announcement when like companies will announce earnings on a Thursday and that Friday expiration, those options have one day to live after a big event. It always makes it interesting to speculate, which it is a speculative trade on that earnings report and have all that volatility and time premium come out. So I do understand the uh, the the lure of 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 these option contracts uh, because of that dynamic, uh, that high gamma, high theta option contract. I, I get it, but I'm kind of hoping it, it it's uh, later as opposed to sooner in uh, these one off underlyings that are popular. Yeah, you know, I'll never put anything past the exchanges to make money, <laughs> right? And they they see money in them, the hills, so they're going to try to go at it. But the, the thankfully, as you mentioned, there are some impediments along the way. I don't think OCC is really is really down to expand these much to single names. I don't know if the technology is really there yet. And of course, there's issues with stock options. As I said, stock options they settle into stock, not into mm-hmm. cash. So that adds all sorts of other layers of complexity to this issue that I don't think are going to be sorted out. So that raises the question as we've discussed on the show in the past. Are they then going to try to do cash settled stock options first? Is that where we're going first? Mm. So do we need a second new product before we can bring in this other new product? So there's a lot of, I think, layers of abstraction that have to be worked through. So I think Tim, I think we have Tim asked this. I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. As much as I know the exchanges want to print money, they are all the end of the day for profit public companies and they see money here. But I think eventually we'll see more of this ilk. Just I'm with Brian. I don't think it's anytime soon for all the reasons we've outlined here. Uh, many times in the past, there just, there's too many hurdles to overcome in the near term here before we see a zero day contract on Apple. Now, you can still trade the weeklies on Apple. You can go out and trade an Apple weekly expiring on Friday. You could do that on Friday, in which case you have effectively done a zero day trade. So it's not like you're out of the loop. It's just the other four days of the week you got to. You got to kind of work at it a little bit. All right, let's go to oh, so our old buddy Meets, one of our pro members, Meets with the Z, says, "Can Brian please spend some time discussing ratio put spreads on OPR? When does he use them, and what is his ideal setup for them?" Thanks. Well, Brian, our audience knows what they like. In this case, uh, they like themselves a little bit ratio put spreads. He's talking about, I'm assuming the you know the the long ones, short two type of ratio. That's usually the one our audience is more a fan of. Not the other way around. We do see those sometimes, but usually it's long one, shorting two. That's how I'm going to take it here. What are your thoughts on that? Are you a big fan of ratio one by two put spreads, as Meats wants to know? And then if so, when do you use them and what is your ideal setup for them? Well, you, okay. The, yeah, I was going to go the other way with it, actually, Mark, where you're uh, selling a put to buy two of them. So you're saying in this scenario, we're going to have unlimited risk? I see right. it as, as the way I see a lot of our audience asking about it is they want to come in and buy a put, but maybe they don't want to shell out too much. They go for the ratio because they don't mind maybe picking up the stock at a lower level. And if not, they get that put for free or maybe sometimes a credit, which is, I think, the more attractive way to do it. Uh, so it's kind of almost like a, a, a fly, but you're not doing that last leg, right? Right. So let's do it both ways. Um, because one of the things inside the playbook, I do have a back spread with puts. And I don't talk a ton about uh, plays where you have that unlimited risk. Well, you'd be limited to the downside, you know, because uh, obviously stock can only go to zero. But with that said... If I look at the back spread with puts, the way it's laid out in the playbook where I'm selling one and buying two, sometimes I like to look at that strategy as a protection, as a hedge. It would be a little bit of a covered ratio put spread where I might own the stock and I don't want to pay for my insurance. So I sell an expensive put to buy two uh, of less expensive option contracts. And this would be the black swan event, the one that would protect you if you get that huge move to the downside. Now, the problem with doing this with puts and doing it in the scenario that I just painted is that uh, the further you go out of the money, a lot of times implied volatilities will increase. The, the skewing in the put makes a little bit harder to try to pull that trade off and get a decent credit, which would be your goal, 
of doing that trade. So it's some people would even call it a buy now, pay later, because if you buy it now and the market just slowly goes down, you're going to have some risk on the trade. Um, but it does protect you from the, the, the big blowout to the downside down 20, 25%. Maybe I do it around an earnings. Maybe I'm doing it just because I, I, I'm nervous about a, a big headline that is happening. Um, you know, trades like this, uh, we're always, in, you know, we're a stock that I always kind of come back to uh, even before the pandemic is like Boeing. Uh, when were the planes uh, with the, the Max and all the issues that they had? When were they going to release the planes and let them fly again? And there just was so much news and underlying stock. That's when I might consider a, a, a trade like this, where the underlying is just being bombarded with news headlines. Also, you know, we looked at long straddles because it's fairly similar to that, but this would be a cheaper version of it. Now, if you look at the other scenario, and maybe we'll do that scenario, meets we'll we'll come back and uh, I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll may I haven't talked about it in a while. I do know that over the four hundred plus episodes that we've done, that I have talked about a. Uh, uh, both uh, cases of a ratio put spread, but I d don't mind it if you like the underlying stock. If you have the cash and you do want to buy that underlying stock, um, I do not mind that trade. Uh, as Mark said, where I'm painting a picture where if the stock does come down, I can actually get uh, a, a, a decent credit to my account and I would be buying the stock at a lower price. I don't like it as a, as a way to just speculate on the underlying. And a lot has to do uh, just with the, the way, you know, markets have a tendency to go down a lot faster than they do go up. So I don't want to do it with a lot of leverage, uh, especially I, we're talking about retail customers to do that trade. Um, but that's one thing that I might consider in a marketplace like this, where we could be bottom, bottom fishing on stock. So maybe that's why that why it came up uh, right now, because the markets are really choppy and you just want to pick your places to allocate some capital. And I don't think it's a bad way to do it. That's simple. I got a little long winded there, Mike. I apologize. No, I like it. And I, it's a strategy I don't mind as well. Like I said, I, I, don't, I mean, if you really want to straight up just buy the stock at a certain level and you want to use options to do it, you nothing wrong with just selling the put if you're okay buying the underlying at that level. But if some of the reasons Brian laid out or, you know, other sometimes people are just maybe not quite comfortable getting there. Maybe they like a strike a little bit lower below the money. They're not getting a ton of premium to do that. Rather, they can find a way maybe the put skew is a little bit elevated so you can take advantage of buying something nearer at the money, selling too farther out of the money type of puts. And you can do that for a decently attractive level, maybe even a decent credit. Yeah, then I see nothing wrong with that. You're getting the short put to still benefit from buying the stock at that level if you want it. But along the way down, you get a little bit of cushion. You can actually make some money on that long put in the near term. So I, I don't hate uh, the one by two either. I think that's a, at least in this scenario, selling one, buying two is a different beast. That's, you don't see that as much with puts just because it's a put. There's limited downside. <laughs> so you don't really have puts exploding down. I mean, obviously you can. You usually see the sell one, buy two more to the upside and products like VIX because they have infinite room to run to the upside. And that's what you need for a trade like that. You need it to really explode, wave through your strikes. So with a put, that's just harder to do structurally. So we don't see them as much. Uh, let's go here. Speaking of weird strategies, we don't see as much, Brian. We got this question here from Crispus. Crispus with a K. Crispus wants to know, I, I came across the, quote, covered straddle recently during some online searching. I don't think Brian covers this strat in his playbook. Is this a trade that he likes and any plans to discuss it on future episodes of the podcast? Well, you're in luck, Crispus. We are dis we are discussing it now <laughs> because of your question. Yeah, I don't think you have a whole chapter devoted to the coverage straddle, Brian. If you did, I missed that in the in the playbook mm -hmm. there. So let's start there. Uh, what are your thoughts on this strategy, sir? Well, covered is an oxymoron here, right? Uh, like jumbo shrimp. Um <laughs> Because you're not really covered. You, uh, you, you, you. If you do a covered straddle, you own the stock. You sell a covered call on it, but then you also sell the put. And if it, you're implying a straddle, you're implying that you're using the same strike. So the call is the same strike as the put. So something's going to happen. The the ideal scenario would be that the stock doesn't move at all. You get some time decay, 
uh, in both sides of the option on the put and the call, and you can close it out and just be long the stock. I guess that would. So the fact that you're talking about a straddle uh, as opposed to maybe a strangle where you're out of the money on the call and the put, it, it's not a very popular strategy um, in general be, you know, for everything I guess I just laid out. I like the strategy and the concept of it. And as a matter of fact, one of our biggest clients, a registered investment advisor, this is all they do. Um, they start with the covered call side of things, though, where they're going to buy the stock, sell the call, and then they kind of do- use the put to dollar cost average on the downside. And they're usually doing them fairly close to where the underlying stock is at. So the concept is that you're using the stock as a conduit to bring in income above and beyond any dividends the stock would pay. Not necessarily trying to make money on the depreciation of the stock. You're trying to bring in monthly income uh, month in and month out from the writing of the call and the writing of the put. And you're saying to yourself, well, if the market goes down, I'll buy more. And one of the the little tricks to the trade and one of the biggest things that they try to do when you're doing this strategy is uh, never sell a call at a cost basis that is that would uh, give you a loss on the stock. All right. So let's think about that for a second. So very popular strategy on a conservative basis to try to bring in income month in and month out. Think of a retired person uh, and they have stock and they need monthly income as opposed to a capital appreciation. So there's a lot of opportunities for this trade. I just don't love the like the fact that we came in and said covered straddle, implying that the put and the call are the same stripe. So if I do this trade and the way that it would be set up is I buy the stock, I sell a call. Stock goes up, gets called away. That's great. Let's go find another stock. Stock goes down and I end up saving some of my capital and I do it on a cash secured basis and I buy more. But now here's the trick to the trade. I'm not going to sell a call that's going to pin me on a loss on the underlying stock. So if it continues on down, I'll buy more. So it's you want to do it in stocks that are fairly solid, not necessarily volatile, just solid stocks. And I am going to try to bring in income from the options. So my whole goal is to sell options more so than to be right on my stock. I mean, probably more detail than you needed. But yeah, I like to trade. I like the concept of the trade. Um but I would do it in a different fashion. I would do it as a, the the term I would use if I did it in the playbook and we covered it in detail would be a covered uh, a strangle as opposed to a straddle. Yeah, I, I like everything you just said there. I definitely like it better as a strangle than a straddle. A straddle, you're right. That's just a, this kind of crazy town. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mark, if I jump in, I you know, I think it would be an implied volatility move then, right? So you're doing it on a volatile stock and you're really hoping balls come in and you're going to close it before the expiration. That's the only thing I can think of, right? Why yeah. you would do it as a, yeah. as a, as a straddle. That's pretty much it. I mean, we don't see these right. too often. You're right. For the reasons you laid out, I think back in the day when, uh, OIC was, was trying to workshop and run studies on a lot of different strategies that they could hand out to advisors and institutional clients. They, they tried this one, I think, for a little bit, and then they just scared the hell out of people. <laughs> well, <laughs> and so, yeah. they, <laughs> so they backed yeah. off. So the ratio, because so like when you look at a front spread or a ratio call spread, you know, they would always bill that as the repair strategy. I remember that from the Options Industry Council days. Remember where uh, you yes. buy one and sell two, yes. and if the stock goes up, you know, you're like, I don't want the cheese anymore. Just let me out of the trap. Yes, repair strategy. Funny you should yeah. mention that, Brian. Funny uh-huh. you should mention that because that dovetails very nicely into our final question here. This comes from Jacob, Jacob Stoker. If I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize, Jacob. He says, hi. Well, hello, Jacob. <laughs> Do you have any documentation or podcasts that talk about how to close out one by two call spreads on stocks that I own. He puts in parentheses the stock repair strategy, uh, which again is just what Brian was just talking about. The particular scenario would be when the shares are trading above the calls that I sold. I am wondering if the one by one portion would cancel itself out at expiration 
and I would get called away on the remaining calls sold, or if I would get assigned on the call that I bought that was in the money, my goal would be to not pick up extra shares, but profit from the bought option and then get called away on the entire position. Thanks. I always enjoy listening to your broadcast. Well, thank you, Jacob. And we have done a bunch of shows on the one by two ratio, aka the stock repair strategy, definitely on options boot camp. I'm sure Brian's touched on it in the past on this one as well. I don't think we have anything specifically that details getting out of it, but I guess we're going to do that now. So it's a good, good question here, uh, Jacob. And you kind of, in a way, answer your own question. If you're not familiar with the one by two ratio repair strategy, listen, Brian kind of just laid it out. It's usually you have a stock that you own. It has gone against you in some capacity. And then now instead of just doing the old buy and hold trade that everyone does, you turn it into a long term buy and hold and wait for the stock to get back to your break even. Using options, you could lower that break even to a much more reasonable level. And that is usually by buying one, usually around at the money type option. So now you're saying, wait a minute, I'm buying another option against a stock I'm already losing. Yes, but then you're turning around and selling two now farther out of the money options, usually at a calls, I should say, at a strike where you're comfortable having the stock get called away. And hopefully you've done enough math and analyzed it a bit to say, okay, if I get that stock called away at that level, I can break even at a lower level. That's the whole goal with this trade. And Jacob, you kind of point that out. That is the goal to get your stuff called away, get your stock called away, the options taken away, and you end up breaking even or making a little bit of money even at a much lower level. So Brian, I can go on more. Do you have anything you want to add here to Jacob about how he should take off his his stock repair strategy? Well, first of all, I want to say that I had no idea this question was coming. So when I said that, stock <laughs> that was just serendipity. Was well, there you go. There That's you go. Your inner voice told happen. you it was time to talk about stock repair. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't, I have not thought about this in a while, but I, you know, in this marketplace, the, the, the strategy does uh, make a lot of sense. If I'm looking at doing the trade, the biggest thing about the stock repair strategy is you're usually trying to get it done for a small net credit to the account. And the downside is that if you are down more on the stock, uh, then like, let's say we're down 20, 25%, a lot of times you're going to have to go out further in time. So the issue is, is if the stock does make that, well, let's, you know, use an old phrase, dead cat bounce, and it gets halfway back, that's usually the way that you would set it up. Um, if it happens too fast, sometimes you just have so much premium in the two calls that you sold that it's, well, what do I do now? Because I'm not getting all the bang for my buck because there's not enough time decay that happened on the option contracts that I sold. So I, I think that's what where the question stems from on here. And it's there's not a great answer for it. If you hang around and wait for the time decay to happen to make your ratio spread, the, the you know, the part of the strategy that's trying to reward you for making it halfway back on your loss, uh, you know, well, you got the once again time risk. So I know we want to get it called away. I, I think most of the time, if it does come back to that area, you really just want to close it out and say, okay, I didn't get my my full value of my long call spread that I added to the trade. But uh, I usually like to err to the side of uh, getting out too soon as opposed to too late in option trading. I think that that would be my rule in that scenario. So I would just close it out and uh, you know, uh, sell, sell the stock and, and move on to the next trade and be happy that I did the repair strategy to start with. Yeah, you pointed out there's a lot of challenges with this strategy, and we've always yeah. pointed that out whenever we discussed it. I mean, it sounds good on paper. It looks really cool on paper. Oh, it's like a magic trick, right? I can, <laughs> I can magically erase yeah. my loss and get a better. Problem is they never really line up that way. As you mentioned, you usually have to go out farther than you want and that runs into all the issues of if it shoots up too soon, what do you do? Also, getting the strikes to line up with the premium, that's always a challenge. As you mentioned, you want to get it for a credit or at least neutral. You don't want to shell out more money on a trade you're already losing on. That's definitely not what you want to do. So it's it sounds cool, looks cool on paper. The practicality of these trades a little bit different. That's kind of what you mentioned here as well, Jacob, which you asked specifically about expiration. So let's fast forward it all the way uh, to expiration there. Remember, you're buying one. 
selling to you and you also have the stock. Now, you're assuming in your example, the underlying has now moved all the way up past the level where you're short the two calls. And you're saying, what happens there? Does the one by one portion cancel itself out at expiration? And when I get called away on the remaining call sold, uh, yes, is pretty much the answer to all that. <laughs> or would I get assigned on the call that I bought? And remember, that's all a package, right? It's all in the money now. So you're in the money call. Yes, I would recommend you close that out anyway. But you could obviously sell that spread for pretty much uh, the full value of it at that point at expiration. You can, if you wanted to, let it all get called away. And then, of course, the short call, the extra short call that is now also in the money, that will get called away along with your stock. And now you're pretty much done. But yeah, technically, if you wanted to let it go all the way uh, through expiration, the in the money call that you have would be automatically exercised. You would get long more stock than the short call that is in the money as well would automatically be assigned. And so therefore, that would cancel out. And you're buying shares lower, selling them higher. And then you also on top of that are selling the additional shares that you already owned at that level of the strike as well. So it would all net cancel itself out. But you probably should sell the call spread before expiration just to get rid of that. Uh, Mr. Brian, anything you want to add on the specific expiration scenario that he points out? No, I, I'll just say it bluntly. So I'm going to sell the long call spread and get assigned on the short call and give my shares away. I mean, that's kind of the, the way there's other approaches to it, but I think that makes it simple. So you just break it down. You say, I got a covered call and I got a long call spread. I'm going to sell the long call spread try to get the maximum for that, and then let my stock get called away. I think that's just the simplest way to approach it. That is indeed. At the end of the day, you're looking for your stock to get called away, right? Jacob, you want it to go. (laughs) Hopefully for a... At least you said that. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So he knows knows what he's getting into. He just maybe is a little bit confused by the two, which is understandable. These are a lot of moving parts with these trades here. But Brian, that music means we come to the end of another huddle. I wish you and I could huddle up for hours. We'll have to do that someday. We'll have a mega huddle palooza and we'll just go for like hours. What do you think? Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. (laughs) These are my favorite shows, as I've mentioned almost every time we do them. Well, folks, in between episodes of The Huddle, and I know it's hard to believe you do other stuff other than OPR. If folks want to check out said other stuff, where should they go? What should they do? Well, the easiest thing to do is just follow me on Twitter because I tweet about all the events that we do at Ally Invest. And my handle is very simple. It's at my name, at Brian Overby. So please check us out. And as always, uh, till the next time, may all the option contracts that you bought finish in the money and all the ones you sold finish out. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.